Mark chapter 4, verse 41, Jesus has just miraculously calmed a storm at sea. Um, his, he and his disciples are in a boat. This storm is so massive, so terrifying, that these seasoned fishermen are freaking out, and they, they wake Jesus up because Jesus has just taken a nap because he's tired. And uh, they wake Jesus up, and so he wakes up. He, he, he speaks to the sea and, and speaks to the storm, and suddenly everything's still. And when that happens, the disciples, it's like their eyes opened up, and they realized they're amazed. They're like, who is this guy in the boat with us? Mark 4, verse 41 says, They were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The disciples are just in awe and surprised that, you know, they've seen Jesus do miracles. They've seen him confront demons, cast them out of people. They've seen him heal the sick, just do incredible miracles. But suddenly there was something different about this where they went, oh my gosh, who is this man that's in the boat with us? And all the storms, all the the waves that were around them. Earlier it says that they were afraid of those things because they saw these waves. They saw the storm. They were afraid of it. But now when they see Jesus, all those things they were afraid of, those don't matter anymore because suddenly they realize Jesus is in the boat with us and he is way more powerful than that stuff. But now we're kind of freaked out about this guy. What's he going to do to us? If he could speak and calm the storm, is he going to speak and turn me into a toad now? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? Um, we need, I think we need our eyes opened up where we're like, we're so used to Jesus. We're used to the fact that Jesus loves us. Jesus is God who came to the earth and he died for our sins. He forgave us of our sins. He set us free from sin. Jesus has healed us. He's, um, he, he's changed us. He's changed our mindset, our worldviews, everything. He changed us from the inside out, healed us physically, spiritually, emotionally, um, set us free from demonic stuff. But we can get so used to it. We're like, yeah, whatever, that's just Jesus, you know. Jesus is awesome. We need our eyes opened up like the disciples where we realize, oh my gosh, this man is amazing. This God is amazing. And so that's the, the point of this series and why I'm going to keep talking about it for a while because I think we still need that. I think even, even if we think we're, we're there and we're like, yeah, I get it. Jesus is awesome. Okay, we need to be reminded of that because we leave and we, we go to work, we go to school, we go hang out with our friends and family, and it, it, it's easy to forget how awesome Jesus is, how powerful he is, how beyond belief Jesus really is. So we've got to constantly remind ourselves, Jesus is bigger. Jesus is more powerful. He's stronger. He's wiser. He's better than anything around us. Amen. Um, so just to review what we've, where we've been, where, where we've gone in this series a little bit here, um, started out just talking about how wherever Jesus went, he, while he was on the earth, wherever he went, whatever he was doing, he was always confounding people. There's a number of times where his friends, his disciples, his family, his critics, they're seeing Jesus do something and they respond, who is this? Whether it's with, they see the wisdom that he spoke with and they go, who is this guy who speaks with such authority? Um, or they, they see him cast out demons. They see him heal the sick. And they're like, who is this man who has this power? Everywhere he's going, he's confusing people, he's astounding people, he's amazing people because they've never seen anyone like Jesus before. No one like Jesus has ever, no one came before him like him, no one after him. Jesus is unique in the entire history of humanity. Um, so wherever he was going, they, he's confounding people and they're surprised at this man. And then we looked at, uh, there's hundreds of names of Jesus in the Bible and we looked at a, a handful of those. I, well, I think we made it through maybe, I don't know, maybe a hundred of them actually, um, just looking at the names of Jesus. Um, and then, then we looked at different complementary characteristics of Jesus, how, how Jesus is Savior and Lord. He's healer and deliverer. He's the king and the judge. He's God and man. These things that seem, there's many characteristics and titles of Jesus that on first glance it seems like, wow, those are opposite, or those don't, how do those work together? That, that, that they actually, they work together really well. Jesus is so unique and so amazing that, yeah, he can be, all of this at once. He can be the Savior and the Lord at once. He can be 100% God and 100% man all at once, and he has to be. Um, and then, then the last time I, I, I shared on this uh, series, a month ago, I talked about, well, I called the message, his incredible impact. The word incredible in Latin, well, it comes from Latin. It's Latin-based, and it literally means beyond belief or that, unable to be believed. When you look at the impact that Jesus has had on history, on society, on culture, if it was anybody but God himself, you would look at that and say, 
no, that's not possible. I don't believe that. No one can have that kind of an impact. Like, if, have you guys seen, uh, what's the movie, Forrest Gump? Anybody seen Forrest Gump here? Yeah. All right, Forrest Gump, I don't remember all the stuff about it. I watched it way too much as a kid, so I should remember everything about it. But um, Forrest Gump, you see Forrest Gump go through, these, go through life, and he's having this impact that's ridiculous. Like, he's teaching Elvis how to dance. Uh, he wipes his face and invents the smiley face. And um, I don't remember, he's meeting Nixon, I think. And he's just going around, causing, changing the world in these incredible ways, and he's just Forrest Gump. And so you, you watch the movie, and I, I hope nobody watched the movie and said, wow, this is really amazing that this Forrest Gump is an actual historical figure, and he's the one who started all this stuff. No, you watch it, and you go, what the heck? That's ridiculous. And it's kind of funny. And, um, but, but, but we're not supposed to believe that. But you look at Jesus, the impact that he's had on culture and on history and everything, it's sort of the same thing where you see it and you're like, how can this be true? Well, it is true, and it can be true because Jesus happened to be the Messiah. He happens to be God in the flesh. Um, all right, so last time I talked about his incredible impact on the world and on history. Um, let me go real quick through that stuff because it ties into what I want to share today. Um, big picture... Uh, there are about a third of the world population, 2.3 billion people in one form or another today, declare allegiance to Jesus, this one man. Um, there, the book that prophesied his coming and showed his life and showed the lives of his followers, the Bible, is the best-selling book over all of history, ever, you know, above, beyond any other book. Uh, Harry Potter almost beat it out. But thanks to the Gideons, Harry Potter lost. <laughs> if you take what the Gideons were doing with the Bible, if you take them out of the picture, Harry Potter won. But way to go, Gideons. You kicked their butt. Harry Potter, you're still number two. <laughs> uh, it's been, the Bible has been translated into more languages than any other book, that, any other w work of writing that's ever been made, you know, far beyond um, the, any other book. Um, because it's just had that much of an impact on our society. Last week, last week, last month, I talked about just a number of ways that he's impacted our, our world. So you can go to the next screen here. Go real quick through this. The dating system, you know, a B.C. and A.D. goes back to Jesus, his birth. Yearly calendar. There's things like Christmas, Easter, Good Friday, parts of Jesus' life that people all over the world celebrate, or if they don't celebrate, they at least get the day off, um, or they can't do business with parts of the world that celebrate it because of Jesus. The um, week, the fact that we have seven days and that we have Saturday and Sunday off typically goes back to Jesus. People's names go back to Jesus, his followers, or Jesus' forebears. It's really weird that you could go to like the jungles of Africa, and I've been there, and you could meet people with Jewish names. They're not Jews, they're, but they have Jewish names, like David, Mary, those are all Jewish names. Why do they have Jewish names? Because Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. It's so you could have people in the middle of Africa, in the middle of the Middle East. You could have people all over the world you can find that have names related to Jesus. Um, other, and, and Jesus was a poor rabbi in the Middle East. He wasn't a king. He wasn't a political leader, not a military leader. But you see more people with names related to Jesus than any other figure throughout history. Um, people don't name their kids Caesar. Caesar was the most powerful man in the world at the time, and now they name their dogs Caesar, but not their kids. Um, Buddha, not a lot of kids named Buddha. Poseidon. Genghis, <laughs> you don't see a lot of that, but you see names related to Jesus and his disciples and those that you know, led up to Jesus, his forebears. Geography and maps. Um, you open up a map and you can see uh, uh, names of states, cities, streets, nations relate back to Jesus or his followers or his forebears. Um, the development of science came from a, a Christian understanding. The, the fact that God came to earth as a man that inspired Jesus' followers to, to realize that means that the earth is good. If God came to the earth as a man, it means the earth is good. And as we study the earth, it means we study God. And so science came out of a, a Christian understanding that came out of the fact that Jesus came. It didn't, science didn't come out of the Middle East. Uh, I like to joke that you know, the, the, the Arabic culture did not give us science. The Arabic culture gave us zero. Um, they literally came up with the, the, the first to invent using the, the number zero. Yeah. I, love, I love Arabs. I love their food, and I love zero. That's great, too. It's good to have zero, especially if it's on this side of the... 
that side of the decimal, you know. It's important where you put that zero. Um, the development and spread of technology. Um, a lot, Christians, you know, Jesus inspired his followers to worship God, to spread the gospel, and to alleviate suffering and take dominion on the earth. Um, and so Jesus, there were technologies that were de developed throughout the world that did nothing. They went nowhere until Jesus' followers saw that and went, ooh, I could spread the gospel with that. You know, uh, things like, like bookmaking. The Chinese made books, but they didn't really do anything with it. When the Christians in like uh, medieval Europe, when they started, well, even before that, during the Roman era, um, the, going back to the Irish monks, they really, um, they saw what the Chinese were doing. They grabbed a hold of that and they said, this is a way that we can preserve the word of God and we can spread it throughout the world. Technological advances at their time that um, were invented in other places, but when the Christians saw it, they said, we can give glory to God with this, so let's do it. Let's Let's build it, let's make it better, let's spread it all over. Clocks, um, glasses, invented, uh, monks invented glasses so that they could read and study the scriptures better. They, they took clocks from, I think India had the first clocks. They took clocks from India and used them so that they could organize their day and pray at the same time every day. Um, so um, we see the, a lot of the development and spread of technology was motivated by the fact that people love Jesus, they want to make him known, spread the gospel, worship him better, and alleviate suffering on the earth. Um, language, language, as we know it, was shaped by Jesus and the Bible. There's idioms, and the way we talk in English, in German, in Hindi, the uh, other languages, I, those are the main ones that I've studied on this, um, our modern languages, many of them go back to Jesus and the Bible. Um, what else? Art. Artists, many famous artists throughout history were inspired by Jesus and the Bible. Music, same thing. Um, many of these musicians and great composers of the past, we hold them up and say, wow, that was beautiful, a great moment in our culture. Well, he did that for the glory of God. Um, like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, a lot of these guys were doing their music to bring glory to Jesus or to, make, to, to spread the message of the gospel. Um, then cultural concepts. Let's go to the next one here. Here's a massive list. I don't know if you can even read that from where you're sitting. It's kind of small writing. Uh, many of our modern concepts that are part of our worldview, they go back to Jesus' teachings in one way or another. I'm just going to read through this quick because I think it is good. Um, and it's important to remind ourselves of this because there, it, it's become popular in the past few years to... Um, speak against Western culture and say, oh, that was from, that's colonialism. That's um, the, the patriarchy trying to influence our world and we want to throw that stuff out. No, actually what we got from Jesus that's impacted the Western culture stuff is good. Stuff. Don't throw it out. Um, and so if we start throwing that stuff out, well, a lot of our society is based on these concepts. And so if we're throwing out the foundation, the stuff we're based on, what are we left with? Um, so we've got things like limited government, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, right to property, right to a fair trial, right to self-defense, and on the opposite side of that, possibly peaceful resistance. These things come from Jesus or the Old Testament, which Jesus preached and Jesus believed, and the reason that we you know, hold those things to be true is because Jesus and his followers spread it everywhere. Without Jesus, we wouldn't hold on to these things. Separation of church and state goes back to things that Jesus said. Individual responsibility, forgiveness being a virtue, humility as a virtue, sexual purity as a virtue, um, the nuclear family as something of an accepted norm. And these things are being trashed and railed against nowadays, but you know, for many years they were a foundation of Western society. Human dignity, compassion for the weak, children as worthy of protection and care, the sick and hurting as worthy of care, women as having value and worth, hypocrisy as a negative quality. Pride is a negative quality. Pro the Protestant work ethic. These things were all go back to Jesus or the Bible that he preached. Um, the honor of physical work. Um, there's cultures that look down on physical work, whether it's nowadays, modern cultures, or cultures throughout history that have spoken negatively about those who have to work physically. But we as a society, we don't look down on that. You know, we don't set aside the, the mechanics. We don't say, yeah, you're, you're beneath the teachers because all you know is mechanics. You know, that's really not that important. The philosophers are what's important. We don't, we don't set aside people that are working hard with their hands and say that that's worse in, in, in general. There are cultures that do that. Um, 
Um, why, why do we have that mentality? Why do we think, yeah, it's good. If, if you can be a mechanic, be a mechanic. If you can be a plumber, be a plumber. If you can be an electrician, be an electrician. Why do we say that's good? Well, because Jesus, our Lord, the Messiah, was a carpenter. And so if we look down on physical labor, we'd have to look down on Jesus. Um, and so that's changed the Western mentality. Um, the high place of serving, because Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He is a servant king. Uh, the value of education and learning, because Jesus said, love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, there are cultures that don't put value on learning. Um, logic and rationality is good. Again, there are cultures throughout history and in the modern world that don't, look, that, that, that don't hold logic and rationality as good things. They look down on them. Why, why do we uphold them as good? Because Jesus upheld them as good. He made logical statements. He appealed to people's minds, not solely to their minds, also to their hearts and their spirits, but he, he, he validated logic and rationality. The, the Hindus, they don't, they don't hold up logic and rationality. The world is not rational to them. Um, logic means nothing. You can say the sky is blue, and you can say the sky is not blue, and they're like, yes, you're both right. That's Hinduism. Christianity, though, is based in logic and rationality. Not so many of the concepts that make up our modern Western world, you can trace them back to Jesus and his followers and the things that Jesus said, the stuff that he did. All right, so today I want to talk about eight major ways that Jesus shaped our modern worldview. Um, I'm only going to make it through three of them. Um, so most of these um, eight things, actually all of these eight things, they come from a book by um, John Ortberg called Who Is This Man? The Unpredictable Impact of the Inescapable Jesus. Um, so these are not, you know, I didn't come up with these, but these are things that he points out in his book. And I went, oh, that's really good stuff. I want everybody to know that stuff. So number one of these eight major ways that, shape, that Jesus shaped our modern worldview, number one is human dignity. Jesus started, well, you could say he started this concept or really he found this, he took this from the Old Testament and then he blasted it all over the world through him and his followers. But Jesus really made known this idea of human dignity, the, the idea that everyone has intrinsic worth as a person. Before Jesus, this was not popular. In the ancient world, the, people didn't view it that everyone had inherent rights and that everyone at, was in, a, a bearer of the image of God. In the ancient world, the powerful and the beautiful were honored. Um, Greeks and Romans praised physical strength and athletic skill. In the Olympics, they made statues and, and drawings to emphasize physical beauty. Uh, the general understanding was that the king bore the image of God. No one else did. And society went in a hierarchy. You had the gods, then you had the king, then you had the priesthood and, and, and other nobility, and then the merchants, and then everybody else down there. But only the king in the ancient mindset, only the king bore the image of God. You, know, you think like Pharaoh calling himself God, Caesar calling himself God. The rest of us, in their mindset, didn't carry the image of God, so we didn't matter. Only the king was the one that was stamped with approval by God himself. Um, so if the king's the only one that matters, well then, and the only one that bears the image of God, well then they don't have to show any, you know, none of us have any real dignity. We don't matter, ultimately. They could treat the weak and the poor however they want. Um, Jesus, on the other hand, showed things complete, completely different. He showed that every life had value and worth. Even the poor, the deformed, the sick, the hurting, the weak, all of us bear the image of God. Jesus himself was born um, supposedly the illegitimate son of a poor family. He, uh, he didn't just associate with the elites, the nobility. Um, he did. He, he did go to dinners at you know, priest's houses, and, and he spoke with King Herod, but he associated with everybody. He went to the lepers, the blind beggars. He praised the poor widow who gave her two mice, her two copper coins in the offering. He honored the poor man Lazarus. He let Mary, a woman, sit at his feet with his disciples and listen to his teaching right there with his disciples in a culture that women were treated different and women weren't allowed to do that. You want to know a society's view of human dignity. Look at how they treat the weakest people in a society. Who are the weakest people in a society? Typically the children. Um, they're smaller. They're not quite as bright. And so you look at how they treat the children, and you can see how they view all people and how they um, understand human dignity. The ancient world's view um, of children was that they were only useful if they, they were valued in as much as they gave 
um, gave something, they produced something for the state or the family. They weren't seen as having value in and of themselves because they were human beings. Plato famously called children a mob of motley appetites, pains, and pleasures. He included slaves and women under that description as well, so you know. Uh, Pliny the Elder said about children, none among all the animals is so prone to tears. None among all the animals is so prone to tears as children. Um, Plutarch said that until the eighth day, children were, quote, more like a plant than a human being. Can you imagine saying that? Like your new baby is born and like people come to congratulate you, but they're just a newborn and you're like, yeah, I don't know, it's more like a house plant. It doesn't really matter. That was their mentality. And so in, in Roman law, you could kill your newborn baby up till the eighth day because it was mostly just like a plant until the eighth day. And then suddenly it became human. Um, o, o. M. Baki in the book, When Children Became People, The Birth of Childhood in Early Christianity, um, writes, children were noted for fear, weakness, and helplessness. To be a child was to be dependent, defenseless, fragile, vulnerable, at risk. They did not view that they looked at kids and they didn't say, oh, you have inherent dignity because you're human. They said, you're a nuisance. You're useful later on in life when you produce something for the family or for the state. But until eight days, you're a house plant. And then after that, well, we'll put up with you until you're strong enough to actually do something for us. So as a result of this mentality, abortion, infanticide, and exposure of infants were normal before Jesus. Um, Roman law required that baby, baby boys born with defects if a baby was a boy was born with a defect, he was, Roman law required that he be killed instantly, um, because they wanted boys to look good. They wanted boys to be strong and healthy. And if it's mostly like a plant, house plant, well, then it doesn't really matter. Um, unwanted children were often thrown to wild animals as food. They were thrown in the sewers and left to die. Uh, a few years back, there was an archaeological expedition um, underneath Rome. Uh, digging out some of the sewers, and they found them clogged with the fossilized remains of children's bodies. Just parents that didn't care, just throw the baby away, I don't want them. Many babies were left in dumps or thrown on dung hills. Most of these babies died, but also it was a general practice, uh, it was a known practice uh, that slave traders would go there, they would find the babies and br bring them home, sell them into slavery. Um, and they thought so little of these kids that there's an interesting fact of Greek, the Greek world is that there are hundreds of variations of the, of the name kopros. Kopros is the Greek word for poop. So these slave traders, presumably, this is what historians think, is that the slave traders would find the kids on the, the, the dung piles, and then they thought, thought so little of them that they're like, well, I gotta give them a name. How about little poopy, little turd face? I don't, and so their, their, their whole life then, they've got this name that they're crap, they're poop, they're worth nothing, they're garbage. That's what their society viewed children as. That's the society that Jesus came into. That's the society that Christianity came into. We don't think that way now. Why do we love kids? Why are there schools for kids? Why are there kindergartens? Why are there what, daycares? Why, are, why, why do churches have nurseries and children's church and things like that, because Jesus changed our mentality, that we don't view kids as, as useless unless they're producing something for the state. We don't view them as a house plant. We view them as having inherent dignity. All people have inherent dignity. It goes back to Jesus. Uh, Matthew 18, three through four, Jesus actually held up children as a model of following God rightly. He says, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. With statements like that, Jesus is driving home the fact that these kids have value because they carry the image of God. Matthew 19, 14, the, uh, um, people are bringing their kids to Jesus to be prayed for, and the disciples try to stop them, and Jesus rebukes them and says, let the, children, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. So, the early, so Jesus made these bold statements that Children have inherent dignity, that all people have inherent dignity. He showed love and respect to all people and so, because we all carry the image of God. And the early Christians heard this and they started treating kids differently. As the church spread from Israel into the Roman Empire, things started to change. Um, Christian communities were the first places in the entire history of mankind, as far as we know, they were the first places to ban abortion, infanticide, 
in exposure. You know, exposure, for those who don't know what that means, I guess I should define it. Exposure, when a, someone would have a baby and they didn't want the baby, they just expose the baby, throw it out, leave it on the street, throw it in the sewer, th throw it in the woods, feed a wild animal with it. That's, you know, exposure is a nice way to just say, throwing your baby away. Um, but it was a general practice. But where the Christians went, they were the first communities in the entire history of the world to start banning that stuff, abortion, infanticide, and, and exposure, because they viewed that all people have inherent dignity. Um, followers of Jesus were the first to start orphanages. You know, we, sometimes we have this feeling that, oh, all this stuff was always there. People always had orphanages. People always cared for the sick. People always cared for kids. People always adopted kids. No, it, that came from Christianity. That came from Jesus, because Jesus said that kids have inherent dignity. Kid, people have inherent dignity, because we're made in the image of God. Um, the idea of godparents, I think a lot of us, you've probably heard of the term godparents. Well, that came originally. Nowadays, I don't know if it really means much of anything. I have, I have a godmother. And um, I think I last spoke to her, I don't know, like 15 years ago, probably. And she lives way out on the West Coast. And, um, but back originally, when godparents um, were, be, were, the idea became a thing, was the church noticed, we have a lot of orphans. Um, so it said, OK, what if we decided, what if we made it a thing that when they're baptized, then we also pick some godparents so that if they're their natural parents die, then these godparents would take care of them so that we wouldn't have to have all these orphans running around. And so that's the, the whole idea of godparents came from their, the church's desire to help kids because they have inherent dignity. Um, and so nowadays, people care about kids. People care about, we, we, don't, we don't throw our babies away. Well, most of us, you know, as a culture, we understand that's bad. Like even... Uh, a few years back, there was the, the Gosnell, yeah, and like, oh, the disturbing stuff that came out about him. Even the pro-abortionist people recognized that's not okay, that's wrong. You know, even the radical abortionists, I think, would not agree with the Roman idea that your baby's a house plant until eight days, so do whatever you want with it until then. Um, so even as we see some of these Christian, Judeo-Christian concepts getting eroded were not at the point that the Roman Empire was at. Um, but where does, this, uh, where does this idea come from, that kids have dignity and that all people, whether poor or rich or strong or weak, that all people have human dignity goes back to Jesus. Amen. Number two, compassion for the weak and hurting. Uh, similar, very similar to the concept of inherent human dignity, uh, but Jesus brought this idea into the world. The ancient world did not really care for the weak and hurting. There was no, there, there, there was no societal, cultural feeling that we need to care for those who are sick. We need to care for those in prison. We need to care for those who are hurting. That idea came from Jesus. Um, in the ancient Roman and Greek worlds, they uh, idolized the human form. And they, they idolized beauty and perfection. And so when a baby was deformed, the parents were obligated, if it was a boy, to kill the baby. In, in total, the ancient world viewed deformities as, if somebody had a deformity, you throw them away. Uh, you, you cast them aside. You don't let them participate in society. Um, so ancient Rome and Greece, yeah, they would kill their babies that had deformities. Um, even in the Bible, you see the Old Testament says that people with certain deformities or certain sicknesses are not allowed to come into the temple. Um, and so even in the Old Testament, there were certain distinctions like that, that then the, I don't think God meant as to be an overarching rule. I want you to, if somebody has a deformity, I want you to treat them worse. But, um, but the society, the Jewish culture, did take it that way. Um, but Jesus treated that differently. If someone was sick, if they had a deformity, Jesus went to them and he healed them. He didn't, the Jewish culture said, okay, if you have leprosy, you got to stay over there. You can't be a part of our society. But Jesus went to the lepers and saw them healed. He went to the blind, saw them healed. Um, so today in our culture, we have that mentality. We're not, we don't take all those with deformities. We don't take blind people and put them on an island somewhere. We don't take those who are stuck in wheelchairs and put them on an island somewhere. We don't take people with physical problems and say, oh, get out of society. We don't want you. Why? And that, the reason that we accept everybody in society goes back to Jesus. That's not something the humanists came up with, not something the philosophers came up with. It's something that Jesus did. It originates in him. I heard a testimony recently that um, drives home to this, this point. Um, there was a family in a small village in India whose the, the woman was pregnant. And when the daughter was born, 
the daughter was born with a very disturbing deformity. Um, she had a normal head, but only, only one eye, and then there was another head on top of that head, and that had no eyes, just two eye sockets. It's so they were, the baby was born, it was a two-headed baby, and the people in the village freaked out. They said, this is a demon child, your family's cursed, Satan is coming to our village, kill the baby. They told the parents to kill the baby. Well, the parents were Christians, and they said, no, we can't kill our baby. So instead, they put their baby down for the night, prayed for their baby, prayed that God would heal their baby. They woke up the next morning, and the baby was entirely healed. That extra head was just gone. Two normal, beautiful eyes there. And the little girl is, let's see, so she's, probably, she's in her 20s today. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but she's in her 20s today. Isn't that crazy? But that's the kind of stuff that Jesus did. And that's the stuff he does. That's the world view that he gave us, that you don't throw someone away just because they're not as beautiful as you'd like them to be, just because there's a deformity. You don't get rid of them. You don't set them aside and make a little encampment outside the village for them. But you go to them, and Jesus heals them. And if he doesn't heal them, you accept them, and you love them because they have inherent dignity, and, you're, and we're called to show compassion on the weak and the hurting. Um, and sickness in general, the ancient world did not view us as having an obligation to heal the sick or to care for the sick. The ancient, the ancient world um, viewed sickness as, well, if you're sick, you deal with it for the most part. They had doctors, you know, even Luke in the Bible, he was a doctor. But there was no, like, commandment from God, no mandate from God, care for the sick, care for the hurting, heal those people. But Jesus came, and he healed the sick wherever he went. And then his followers did the same thing. And as a result, the first, uh, the first hospitals that we see, they came from Jesus' followers. Um, Basil the Great and Gregory of Nyssa, Nyssa were the first to start. Well, they started homes to care for lepers, and then those grow in, grew into hospitals. And then people realized, these are really useful things. And so they started hospitals all over. And they eventually made a rule that, I forgot which church council it was, but one of the early church councils made a rule that wherever you build a cathedral, you also have to build a hospital in the same city that you build a cathedral. And even to this day, many of the hospitals throughout the world and clinics throughout the world go back to a church, St. Mary's, uh, Bethel Hospital. Um, they have Christian names that we, we, we should clue you in, like, oh, I bet that goes back to Jesus, but we're so used to it, we don't even think about it. So this whole idea of caring for the sick, that came because Jesus cared for the sick, that Jesus went to the sick and healed them. The early Christians took this very seriously. In the year 165 AD, there was a bad plague called the Plague of Galen. Um, it was a smallpox outbreak in the Roman Empire. And it, it went all throughout the Roman Empire, and it was so bad, and people didn't know what to do. They didn't have modern medicine, they didn't know how to deal with this stuff. And so as it started going from village to village, the uh, non-Christians, they fled. They even left their own parents, they left their own family members, their own children that were getting sick. And they said, I don't want to get sick. And so they just left them there to die, took off, ran, ran away. Even doctors during this plague of Galen took off, ran away, because they just didn't know what to do. They couldn't deal with it. Um, Thuc Thucydides, he wrote in his History of the Peloponnesian War, he writes, he writes about an earlier plague, but this was the attitude that the non-Christians had toward plagues. He says here, they died with no one to look after them. Indeed, there were many houses in which all the inhabitants perished through lack of any intention for care. The bodies of the dying were heaped up, one on top of the other. No fear of God or law of man had a restraining influence. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead, and treated unburied corpses as if they were dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. They saw their own family members, their friends, the people in their cities getting sick and dying, and rather than caring for them and helping them, praying for them, healing them, they took off, terrified, and threw, threw the bodies on the road, got rid of them, got out, got out of there, even before the, the people were dead. That's the mentality that people before Jesus had. The Christians, though, viewed it different. When the, Christ, the Christians knew, okay, Jesus has given us power to heal the sick. We saw Jesus heal the sick. We saw him care for the sick. He told us to care for the hurting. And so they took that mandate seriously. When this plague hit, the plague of Galen, um, they started going to the sick people. Where there was, when they got news that a village 
had uh, fallen sick and everybody had fled, the Christians actually went to that village and they cared for people and they prayed for people. Um, the statistics show us that where, so in total, between one fourth and one third of the, the whole empire's population died because of this epidemic. But there's a huge difference between the cities where the Christians went and the cities where the Christians didn't go. Where the Christians didn't go, 30% to 100% of the cities were destroyed because of this plague. Where the Christians went, only about 10% died. Made a huge difference because they took it seriously that we are called to go to the hurting. We're called to go to the sick and heal them. All right, slavery is another one where Jesus totally changed our viewpoint of slavery. I think most of us in the world today, we understand that slavery is bad. Um, well, in the world today where, where Jesus has affected our culture, we get it that slavery is bad. Well, back in Jesus' day, they didn't view things that way. They viewed slavery as a necessary thing, and they didn't even, not even a necessary evil. The philosophers, all, all of the Greek and Roman philosophers well, almost all of the Greek and Roman philosophers approved of slavery, and um, the only ones that disapproved of it only disapproved of it not because it was immoral, but they said it, it can make you lazy if you have too many slaves. It wasn't like it's bad to have slaves. It's just, well, you sh if you have slaves, make sure you're not lazy as well. Um, but as a society, before Jesus, the Greeks and the Romans, they approved of slavery. They, they, they didn't even view the politicians saw no way that society could function without slaves. Statistics show that between 30 and 60% of the entire Greek and, Greek and Roman Empire were slaves in one form or another. Um, slaves weren't, they had no rights, they weren't accepted, they weren't loved, they weren't respected. They were property to be used as, as you wanted. Under Roman law, they were called, in, in Latin, non, non habens personam, literally not having a person. Um, other translations say not having a face. That they viewed slaves that you're not a person. You don't even have a face. You don't matter. You're just property. Roman masters had legal power of life and death over their slaves. Slaves could be tortured. They could be um, treated however the master wanted. Aristotle, you know, the great Greek philosopher, Aristotle, in all his enlightenment, he says, a slave is a sort of living piece of property, a tool in charge of other tools. There was no viewpoint that this was wrong. They just assumed we should have slaves because that's what we need, and slaves are just tools, and they don't really matter. But Jesus came along, and Jesus showed through his teaching and through his actions that we all have the image of God, and, 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 and we should have compassion and care for every person, and we should, should care about not just the powerful, not just the wealthy, not just those who are free, but we should care about the slaves as well because we're all equal before God. And so Paul, one of Jesus' followers, Colossians 3.28, he says, there is neither slave nor free. Jesus' even later followers took this very seriously. The first time in history that anybody dared to speak against slavery and dared to say that slavery was wrong was a Christian guy. From what we know in history, the first time it appears is Gregory of Nyssa, who lived in the 300s, he's the first one to ever begin condemning slavery. Everywhere else, all throughout history, society has just accepted it and said, this is a good thing. So many, of, many societies said, well, if you're a slave, that must be what the gods wanted you to be. That's Christians cool. started condemning slavery because Jesus showed that we're all equal before God. We all carry the image of God. So the, the fact that we nowadays, in our world, view slavery as something bad, it goes back to Jesus. Um, Prisoners, too. In the ancient world, the ancient world uh, viewed prisoners as having no rights. If you did something wrong, if you offended the king, maybe it wasn't even really that wrong, you just offended the king, they'd throw you in prison and just leave you there to rot. There were hell holes where you'd be cast away and forgotten. There was no idea of, no concept that prisoners have rights, no concept that we should care for prisoners and, and, and treat them decently while they're in prison. Uh, they, Typically, the Greek and Roman world, they wouldn't even provide food. There'd be no visitors, um, no comforts, no rights, no respect. Um, and people in society, they didn't view it like we, sh that we sh they felt no obligation to visit prisoners. But Jesus came and he said, I was in prison and you came to me in Matthew 25. And therefore, directing the disciples, look, you care for those in prison. Care for those who are hurting. Don't just leave them there to rot. Um, 
And so his, his followers, the early church, began to take that seriously. They went to prisoners, um, especially when it was in their own community, when a fellow Christian was put in prison. They would go and they would bring them food, they'd visit them, they'd pray with them. Lucian, a second century pagan writer, um, wrote about how surprised he was that while the pagans, while the, the, the Gentiles, the non-Christians, would just leave their prisoners to rot, that the Christians would go and visit them and pray with them and bring food to them. And he writes in surprise, like, why are they doing this? What, why do they even care? They're in prison. Nobody cares about them. But Jesus said, I was in prison and you came to me, letting us know, care for even the prisoners. And today, prisoners in the modern Western world, in societies that have been touched by Jesus, impacted by Jesus, they can take classes, they can have church services, you can learn skills, you can work, you can earn money, exercise, you can have Bible studies, you can have prayer meetings. There's a lot. We take care of our prisoners really well. Um, you get food. Um, I still don't want to go to prison, but compared to an old prison or a prison in a society that has not been touched by Jesus, yeah, our prisons are pretty dang good. Um, and why do we have compassion on prisoners? Why do, we have compa why, why do we view slavery as wrong? Why do we have compassion on the sick? Why are there orphanages, uh, uh, hospitals? Why are there clinics? Why, why do we not cast aside the deformed and people with problems? Why do we accept them as part of society? Because of Jesus. Because he said, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. He instituted, he, he, he developed this idea, this concept that we should have compassion on the weak and hurting. The ancient world didn't have that. The ancient world, there, was no, there were no philosophers talking about having compassion on the weak and hurting. That comes from Jesus. Mark Nelson, a philosopher, writes, if you ask what is Jesus' influence on compassion, I would suggest that wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lonely, schools, hospitals, hospices, orphanages for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. Why do we care for the hurting? Jesus. All right. Number three, the worth and value of women. Now the men are like, oh, come on. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to hear that one, yeah. No, this is fascinating to me. Jesus totally changed the world's understanding of women, the world's viewpoint, the, wor the way the world treated women. Um, and the reason that nowadays you, you treat, nowadays women can be a part of society, general society, and we don't view women negatively, I, most people as, in general don't anyway, um, goes back to Jesus. It's not the progressive feminists that invented the idea that women have worth. Um, Jesus, well, you know, you could see it in the Old Testament, um, but the Jewish people didn't really <laughs> live that way. And uh, Jesus is the one that really showed, hey, women have value and worth just like men, because women are people too, believe it or not. Um, women, in, in the ancient world, women were unwanted, um, even from birth. There was a law, a Roman law called the Law of Romulus, that said that parents were obligated to raise all healthy uh, boy babies. You know, if he's deformed, you have to kill him. But if he's not deformed, then you are obligated by law to raise any boy baby that, you're, that, that, that comes into your family. Um, but for girl babies, they were only obligated by law to raise the first one. After that, do whatever you want to the girl baby. Um, so there's, first, there's a letter, a first century Roman man was writing to his pregnant wife, and he writes to her, if you deliver our child before I come home, if it is a boy, keep it. If a girl, discard it. Just throw it out. You know, if it's a boy, yeah, take care of him. But if it's a girl, I don't really care. Just get rid of him. Third century BC, um, the Roman uh, Posidipus wrote, everyone raises a son even if he is poor, but exposes a daughter even if he is rich. There was a general attitude that girls don't matter. Daughters don't matter. We want boys. We want sons. We want men. We don't really care about the girls. So in the Greco-Roman world, there was a shortage of women. For every 140 men, there were only 100 women. So guys, you had to work hard to get one of them. Um, among 600 families in Delphi, they found that only six, only six out of 600, so 1% of the families raised more than one daughter. The rest, presumably, 
threw them away, exposed them, killed their baby, baby girls. Um, Outside of Jesus, women were not wanted. Before Jesus came, the Greeks, the Romans, they didn't want girls. And if you can go to other societies like um, Muslim societies, um, China, same thing. People don't want their girl babies until Jesus grabs a hold of a society and starts changing it. And, and people realize, OK, girls are people too. So we should love all people. Um, so in their society, women were unwanted, even from birth. Also, women were considered inferior. Women were seen almost as property. They were generally not allowed in education. They were rarely allowed to travel, mostly just stayed at home and um, were taught things in, in their home and in their small village while the men got to travel. You do see some upper class women um, and it's, it's, w w w were allowed to travel or some women would travel with their husbands. Um, but in general, the idea was the man can go do his thing, you woman, you stay at home. You don't get to learn because that'd be dangerous if the women start reading. In ancient Athens, the uh, women were legally classified as a child, no matter her age or her intelligence. Her whole life long in Athens, she was known legally as a child. In the Greco-Roman world, if a woman was injured or hurt somehow, um, the, the one who injured her or hurt her would not pay restitution to her, wouldn't make things right to her, but they would pay money to her father or her husband because she's just a property. She doesn't matter. And so what they really hurt was the father or the husband. So they would give money to, to them instead of the woman. Um, women couldn't be adopted. They couldn't receive an inheritance. Uh, women were under the legal authority of a, a, a Roman guardian their entire life. Um, even when they were an adult, even when they could make their own decisions, they were still under the authority of a male guardian. Caesar Augustus, he changed that, though. Um, he said, OK, you could finally not be under the authority of your guardian but after you've had four children. Then we'll allow you to make your own decisions about your life, and you don't have to have a guardian making all the decisions. Um, the Jewish world was not really much different. Uh, the, the Old Testament shows very clearly that we are all we all have inherent worth before God, men and women. But the Jewish people really ran with the idea that, that men are better. Um, there, there was a rabbi before the time of Jesus that said, better that Torah should be burned than taught to a woman. Another rabbi, famous prayer in the Talmud. Um, it's a prayer thanking God that I was not made a Gentile, a fool, or a woman. But then Jesus came. So that was the old mentality. That was the ancient world. Men are good. Women are bad. We don't want women. And if we get a woman, she's inferior. Um, but Jesus came, and he did things completely differently. He showed respect, honor, and dignity to women. The longest recorded conversation that Jesus ever had with someone wasn't with his disciples. It wasn't with a king or a ruler. It was with a woman, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. That's the longest conversation that we have, that we see Jesus having with someone. Um, he allowed groups of women to travel with him and his, his disciples. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 1. This blew my mind when I first saw this years ago. Like I, I just pictured Jesus when he's doing ministry, that it's him and his 12 disciples, and that's it. And they're going around... Doing, doing what they're doing. Well, Luke, Luke has a really good way of pointing out that, no, Jesus, the, the compassion of Jesus and how Jesus is open to all, Jew, Gentile, male, female, rich, poor, sick, healthy. Um, so Luke 8, verse 1, soon afterward, Jesus went, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. So not only is Jesus, Jesus is going around his, with, his, with his disciples, and not only does he allow the women to join up as well, and I don't know what they're doing exactly. I don't know, were they praying for people too? Or were they just watching and learning and receiving? Um, but that was a radical thing. Because the, the men and the women in the Jewish society, they did not associate. And the women didn't go to the rabbinical schools. The men went to the schools. But Jesus is like, yeah, you, you can come and learn. You could, you could watch what I'm doing. You could be a part of this. Not only is he allowing them to come along and be a part of it, but they're playing an integral role here. They are supporting him. The, the, the ministry, they're paying for it out of their finances, out of their household's finances. They're, who knows you know, how much money it costs, but it's not, it's not cheap for you know, 13 guys, Jesus and his 12 disciples, to go from town to town. They need food. They need places to stay. And these women that are coming along, they're providing for them. That's amazing. 
Um, he allowed Mary to sit at his feet and learn from him alongside his disciples in Luke 10. When all, at the crucifixion, all the men, all the men disciples except for John, run away scared. But the women stayed. The women stayed at the cross. The women and John stayed behind. Um, they weren't scared. At the, at the resurrection, who was it who got to see the risen Jesus first? It was the women. And who was it who first preached that Jesus was risen? It was the women. It wasn't these men. Um, it was the women. So you could see in Jesus' life that he is treating everyone equally. You know, men and women are different, but Jesus, and in some ways men are stronger, women are weaker, but I've seen some really tough women that I don't want to get in a fight with. Um, some ways, maybe a woman's smarter here, a man's smarter there, maybe a woman's better, better here, a man's better there, you know, whatever. We're all different. And we have different roles, different responsibilities. And, you know, in the home, you have the husband is the head of the household. And there's certain authorities that God has placed over men and women differently. And we have different ways that we work, think, act, all of that. We, we're different, but we're equal in the eyes of God. There's, our society, we understand that, that men and women are both good. Why does our society view things that way? It goes back to Jesus. It's not the feminists. It's not some progressive philosophers. It's that Jesus showed, showed love and respect to all people because we all have dignity as being created in the image of God. And the early church then really ran with that. They followed in Jesus' footsteps. Um, Galatians 3.28, Paul wrote, I mentioned this verse earlier, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What he's saying there, he's not saying literally there's no difference between man or woman. You're all the same, whatever. No, there's some physical differences. There's emotional differences. There's the way we think and act and talk and everything. Okay, we are, God created us different with different gifts, different responsibilities, different roles in life, um, and that's good. But he's, he's not saying there's no difference here at all. What he's saying is we are united. We're one. We're equal in the eyes of God, whether you were born as a Gentile, a Greek, or you were born as a Jew, whether you are born as a slave into a family in slavery, or you were born a free family, whether you were born a male or a female. We are all made in the image of God. We, are all, we all carry God's image on us. We all are, have the glory of God upon us, and so we're all equal in the eyes of God, and we're all equally bad, and we all equally need the gospel to change us. So, that, so Paul says that, and where did he get that from? He didn't just come up with that from nowhere. He came up with that because Jesus showed that. He showed respect and dignity to all people, including women. Um, and the early church ran with that. We see in the book of Acts and in, um, in the writings, Paul's writings and the other epistles, that uh, there's women prophetesses, there's women deacons, deaconesses, so women prophetesses, women that have the Spirit of God and they're hearing God speak and they're speaking God's words. Um, there's women that are deaconesses, that are functioning, taking care of some of the functions of the church. There's women that are filled with the Spirit and ministering in the power of the Spirit. There's women hosting churches. There's women spreading the gospel. Um, Lydia was the first believer in Europe. A woman, Lydia, the first believer in Europe, as, at least recorded in the Bible, what we see, and foundational in the starting of the church in Philippi, and that led to other churches in Europe as well. Um, women were not cast aside and like the rest of society, or like, the re like other cultures had done. But in the church, women had an active role. Some historians suggest um, that there's strong evidence that a majority of the early church were actually women. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked into this enough, but there are some historians that suggest that. One of the interesting bits of evidence that one of these guys pointed to was there's a church in North Africa, um, an ancient city called Serta, where archaeologists were you know, digging up the city, and they found a church there with 16 male tunics, but 82 women tunics, 38 women's veils, and 47 pairs of women's slip slippers. Now, I don't know. Maybe the guys just didn't leave their clothes at church. <laughs> I mean, that, that would seem to give good, good evidence that, wow, there were probably a lot of women in that church. Does that mean that every church had that many more women? I don't know. Not necessarily. That could just be a fluke. Or maybe, we don't know exactly why that was found there. But there's a lot of, there's some historians that say that, that there's some strong evidence that a majority of the early church was, was women. Um, I don't know. 
either way, what the Bible does teach is that women and men, that, we, that women have inherent worth and value and dignity, and women and men, we are equal in the eyes of God. And the reason that we view it that way nowadays in our society goes back to Jesus. It's not the feminists. It's not some progressive ideology. It's because Jesus showed and treated women with respect and care and honor. Um, and so that's why we do it today. Uh, all right, let me, let me just summarize then. So uh, next week, we're going to finish with the other five ways that Jesus shaped our modern worldview without us realizing it. It's really phenomenal. I love it. Uh, so three things we talked about today was human dignity, compassion for the weak and hurting, and the worth and value of women. The ancient world, in terms of human dignity, the ancient world said that only the powerful mattered, but Jesus showed that we all have dignity in the eyes of God because we're all human. We're all made in the image of God. Um, compassion for the weak and hurting, the ancient world didn't have. There was no mandate to have compassion on the weak and hurting. There were, you know, ob obviously there's going to be compassionate people no matter what, but as a whole, their culture viewed no responsibility for the weak and the hurting. Um, but Jesus came, showed compassion on the weak and hurting, the sick, the imprisoned, the, the enslaved, um, the deformed, and, and as a result, we, his followers, we have the same attitude. Um, thirdly, the worth and value of women. The ancient world said that women were inferior and unwanted, yet Jesus showed that women have dignity, have value, um, just as men do because we're all made in the image of God. These, these, these three things have become, in many ways, intrinsic to the Western world. They go back to Jesus. Jesus changed our mentality. Jesus changed our cultural worldview to the point where we just assume this is how things are. We, and now one of the reasons that this is really important, and let me, I'm, I'm going to wrap up right here. Um, one of the reasons that this is vital to remember is because these things are under attack. Jesus is under attack, but we see these things under attack as well. The idea of human dignity, we see being attacked by the pro-abortion crowd that they're, calling, they're looking at a developing human child, and they're saying, yeah, it's okay to murder that thing. It's all right. It's not really a baby. It's just a clump of cells. Who really cares? And there's talk about even after it's born, just let it die. What does it matter? It's just a baby. It's, you know, if it's not giving me anything, if it's not bringing anything into society, if it's going to be hard to raise, if it's got deformities, if it has some, some genetic disorder, what's the point? It's, it's not going give to any, give anything to society. It's not going to benefit me. That, that thing is going to make my life more miserable. It's going to cost me. I'm going to have to leave my job. What's the point? And so we see this human dignity, this concept of human dignity, which has been foundational ever since Jesus and his kingdom started spreading throughout the earth. And Western society as a whole, in many ways, grabbed a hold of this viewpoint. And so the idea of human dignity has been inherent to how we view things. But that's been under attack, um, well, for many years, but even more, it's amped up recently um, with the pro-abortion crowd and those calling for euthanasia. You can get in parts, parts of Europe, if you're getting older and you're just tired of the aches and pains, you can sign up for these suicide pods I was reading about, where they'll just put you in this pod and then, I don't know, put some toxic gas in there, have some beautiful music going on, and you can just die peacefully, just kill yourself. And there's people pushing for that. The radical environmentalists that are looking at the world and saying, boy, we have too many people. We, it would be a lot better if we got rid of maybe 500 million or a billion people. We have this way too many people. One, one guy, was this Klaus Schwab? I don't remember who it was. But one of those radical environmentalists, crazy people, um, was talking about that the, the ideal number of people to have on the planet is 500 million. Any more than that is too much. And so if we could get it down to 500 million, that'd be, that'd be really nice. That's ridiculous. And so he's willing to, to save the planet. There's this mentality that we got to save the planet. So it's OK if we kill however many billions of people we need to to get down to 500 million. It's so this idea of human dignity is being challenged. It's being attacked. It's being rejected. Even in the transgender movement, you know, your baby has dignity. Your child has dignity. And then you have this whole mentality in the transgender ideology that, OK, it's all right to mutilate that child. It's OK to lie to that child. It's OK to tell, him, tell the boy that he's a girl and let him go along with that. That's OK. No, that child has human dignity. That child carries the image of God. And how dare you want to mutilate his body and mess with his mind? That's not OK. So we see human dignity 
the concept of human dignity being challenged and being rejected in many ways in our society, compassion for the weak and hurting, same thing. You see a lot of Marxist ideology on the rise that boils everything down to power dynamics between, between groups of people that are split up between your race, your skin color, your, um, your gender, your income level, and they say uh, your sexual orientation, and they say all of life is boiled down into your, your, these dynamics, these Marxist, and you have Marxist power plays between groups of people, and rather than having compassion on anybody who's weak, anybody who's hurting, our society is railing against that idea and saying, no, you can only have compassion on people who are black, uh, lesbian, transgender, female, I don't know what else. Those people you should have compassion on, even if they have actually in real life a lot of power, a lot of money, and is not sick, not hurting at all, but we should have compassion on them. And we, and we see this rising totalitarian spirit that is not compassionate, doesn't care for the hurting, doesn't care for the weak. This idea that, well, if I want it, and if a majority of us want it, we can force that on the minority, even if it hurts them to get to that point. So we see our society, our culture, casting that aside, compassion for the weak and hurting and the worth and value of women. Um, we see this huge nowadays where if you're a man, you can be a woman. And people are, are saying, well, I don't even know what a woman really is. What does it matter? What, what is a woman? I don't even know. Um, there's no difference between men and women. And anybody can be a woman. The whole transgender ideology. And then you have, on the other side, the radical feminist ideology that basically boils down a woman, woman's worth not to the fact that you're a woman and God made you and that's awesome and he's a man, God made him and that's awesome, but boils down a woman's worth to how well can you compete with men and, 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 and dominate over men. And if you can do that, then, you, then you're worth something. No, that's not okay. Women have worth and value and dignity because God made them, men, same thing. Um, so we see these, idea, these, these concepts that Jesus brought into the world and that have been foundational in our society for years. We see them under attack. Now, and I think a lot of us feel that. We realize that. We see that. So what do we do? Do we pick each of these battles and we say, I'm going to fight this and I'm going to win this war and I'm going to show you why you're wrong? Well, okay, you can do that. And I think if, 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 if you want to, and there may be certain people that are called to plant their feet in the ground and say, no. I'm standing on the truth, like, like Matt Walsh, uh, the Daily Wire, um, with his What is a Woman uh, documentary, where he's like, I got to plant my feet here and just show how this ideology is stupid. And there's other people. Vody Bauckham has been coming out against the, uh, the cultural Marxism. And the so there are people that have taken some of these issues and said, all right, this is my issue. I'm going to fight this, and I'm going to win because it's worth it. And I think God has called some people to do that. But, I think, but in general, how should most of us respond? Well, OK, how did these things become a part of our culture? How did we start respecting women as a culture? How did we start having compassion on the weak and the hurting as a culture? How did we come to recognize that all people have human dignity, no matter how rich or poor or how old or young or, or weak or strong they are. How did we get these concepts? Jesus. As, Jesus. as Jesus preached these things, people grabbed a hold of them and his kingdom, and, it, and they started preaching the gospel. And where they preached the gospel, his kingdom spread. And as his kingdom spread, worldviews changed. And we, so, okay, if we want to get these things back in our culture, I think a lot better than picking issues and fighting about it is preach the gospel. When someone's heart receives the gospel, he changes. When someone realizes, I am a sinner, I deserve hell, but Jesus died for me and he loves me, and they receive Jesus into his life, he will start to see things different because the Holy Spirit comes in and the Holy Spirit will give, give us a new worldview. He'll change our hearts. He'll change our minds. We'll see things in the Bible that you could argue all day with them, but now that the Holy Spirit is in them, he reveals these things and he goes, oh, that makes sense. I'm an example of this uh, with abortion. When I, was, um, when I was younger, I would say that, well, I would never have an abortion if I were a woman, but I think every woman should have a right to an abortion if she wants to. That was my, my attitude. What changed was after I got saved, slowly Jesus started revealing how hypocritical that was, that if, a, if murdering a child is wrong for me, it's wrong for everybody. It doesn't change just because someone else has a different viewpoint of that. If it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, it's right. 
So, but the reason I, I'd heard arguments and I'd heard you know, people discussing different viewpoints of abortion, but what changed my heart was when, the, when I repented, I got right with God, Jesus came inside me and he revealed that I was hypocritical and wrong and stupid and I should change. That's what's going to change our culture. That's what's going to impact the world, not necessarily picking these little battles and fighting those things. Go to the root. The root is people have rejected Jesus. And, the, and why they rejected Jesus? Because we're not preaching Jesus. So get out there, preach Jesus, preach the gospel, and let the gospel transform people. And as the gospel transforms people, then our society will be transformed. Amen. 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 All right, Jesus, thank you for radically changing our society. Thank you for changing our mindset, our worldview, for changing how we view the weak, how we view children, how we view women, how we view... Um, anybody who's hurting and poor and suffering, Jesus, thank you for giving us in, in a, a whole new worldview, a whole new culture. Father, I pray for all of us here, Jesus, that we would be radical about preaching your word um, and seeing your kingdom expand, seeing, people's, seeing people receive your truth and watching as you, Holy Spirit, as you start to work a new culture in people and in uh, families and neighborhoods and ultimately in nations. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.